And it's my pleasure to uh, visit with you all today about this pathogen that actually isn't here yet in North America. We have this unique opportunity to actually study a foreign pathogen that might enter North America soon and try to figure out and unravel some of the ways to stop it before it gets here. A lot of times in wildlife ecology, conservation biology, we're chasing emerging infectious diseases after they've already gotten here. And it takes us a lot of times many years to understand what's going on in order to come up with good ideas to stop the disease, to um, implement different strategies to prevent outbreaks. So um, this pathogen, uh, which I'll go over, is actually e emerging in Europe right now. And we collaborated with uh, Ghent University in Belgium in order to get the pathogen and begin thinking about the potential effects if that pathogen gets here to the United States. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank a variety of collaborators. Uh, it's just not the University of Tennessee. There are a variety of universities that are collaborating with us, including Vanderbilt, UMass, and Washington State University, as well as some of the funding agencies that Mark mentioned. Um, I also want to shout out to the UTI Center for Wildlife Health and the team of students and postdocs and research associates and techs that really make all this work happen. Um, we uh, work really hard to get funds into the university, but it's ultimately this team that implements it and does the great research and, and, and comes up with the great findings. So I want to thank all of them, as well as the UTIA East Tennessee Research and Education Center, specifically Dr. Simpson and Alex Anderson. I saw Alex is in the back. Um, they are, uh, they provide the research facility that we use for all of our research. Um, so, what is this skin devouring fungus that's killing salamanders, okay? The name of it is Batrachychytrium salamandra borans. That's a mouthful, so we call it bee sal. Um, and it was discovered and actually described in, in uh, a, a paper in a, uh, PNAS in 2013, followed up with another paper in Science in 2014 um, in Europe, okay, associated with diets. Uh, there have been a variety of publications, about 20 or so since then, mostly from the Europeans, trying to understand the fungus on their continent. Most of that research being led out again at University of Belgium. Um, there have also been uh, a variety of articles, popular articles, uh, that have been released, especially from uh, Manga Bay in, like, in this last year. So if you're interested in learning more about this fungus, you can, you can search those uh, on that website. Um, so before I jump into talking about the pathogen, I thought that y'all should hear about it from the Europeans themselves. Okay, so that's that Dr. Ann Martell and her husband, Dr. Frank Passmans, out of Ghent University, have been leading a lot of the research um, in, in Europe. So this is just, again, an overview. They first started noticing uh, salamanders doing r r routine uh, population surveys dying uh, in the Netherlands in uh, 2010. Those animals were sent to Ghent University to their College of Veterinary Medicine. and. Uh, the pathogen Batrachychytrium salamander vorans was, was described and discovered and, um, in 2000, and published on in 2013. In 2013, dials also were documented in Belgium uh, to the south of the Netherlands. And uh, also it was found in trade going into the UK and also in captivity in, in um, captive populations in Germany in 2015. In 2016, uh, why, uh, um, a widespread surveillance study in Northern Europe documented it also in Germany in wild populations. Uh, it's, since then, it's also been documented in the wild in the Iberian Peninsula in Northern Spain. Um, it is, as you heard Dr. Martel mention, it's believed to come from Asia. Uh, there, the pathogen does exist in wild populations with no clinical disease present and it also goes back uh, several hundred years in museum specimens. So it's been around for a while, but
but it's believed to have been introduced recently through the pet trade and other, under other aspects, routes of international trade of, of amphibians. It is currently unknown to occur in North America. Now, why is it called the skin devouring, salamander devouring pathogen? This is a skin pathogen, it's a fungus, and what it does is it creates, this is a histological cross section of the skin, and it creates, this is all dead cells. It creates these volcano-like ulcerations, killing cells, epidermal cells, all the way down, uh, actually down into glands, all the way down into the dermis. Now that's important for amphibians because many amphibians use their skin for respiring and they also use it for osmoregulation and that can affect their physiology. Okay, so what is the likelihood and how would B cell get to Tennessee, get to the United States? Well, we already know that international trade is a major um, route of pathogen translocation across the globe and not just uh, wildlife pathogens, okay? It's particularly of concern though for wildlife pathogens because most countries have zero regulations with respect to requiring animal health certificates of animals imported into their countries, including the United States. Zero regulations, okay, for wildlife. Only domestic animals uh, are, are required to have animal health certificates. As a consequence, animals and their pathogens, where they come from, are being moved all over, all over the place. And we've been documenting this as a group of scientists across the globe for a while. With respect to B cell, um, it is being documented in the trade within Europe. It's actually been documented in uh, six different countries now in captive populations, including uh, countries like Great Britain, where it's not known to be in the wild yet, but is in multiple pet stores, etc. So it is certainly being moved throughout Europe in that capacity. And again, that's the main hypothesis of how it got from Southeast Asia, somebody releasing their salamanders very likely, or uh, uh, dumping out contaminated aquarium contents into, into the environment. Uh, what does our trade look like in the United States? Actually, our salamander trade is not extremely robust. We import about 120,000 uh, foreign salamanders, mostly from Asia, <laughs> where this pathogen is, is found, uh, per year, so about 120,000 per year. Uh, the Europeans actually did an analysis uh, and of our trade data and uh, the prevalence of the pathogen over in Asia, and they've estimated that in the past 10 years, it is possible that 66,000 B cell positive salamanders have entered the United States. Okay, although we still have not detected it yet here. That's concerning. However, what's more concerning is that we now know that salamanders are not the only amphibian that can, can become infected. Frogs can become infected too. They don't tend to develop the disease as frequently as salamanders, but they can become infected. One example is the fire-bellied toad. How many of y'all have seen fire-bellied toads in PetSmart or other places, right? Maybe you have one. Fire-bellied toads, we import per year into the United States 440,000 fire-bellied toads from Asia, okay? Um, an estimate uh, in Europe, in Germany, um, estimated the prevalence of B-cell <laughs> at 8% in fire belly toads. If you take that percentage and multiply it by 440,000 animals coming into our country every year, that means it's possible that 35,000 fire bellied toads are entering this co country every year with a foreign pathogen, okay? Again, we haven't detected yet, but I'll also say this, we are not looking at all in the pet trade. There has been fairly heavy sampling led by the U.S. Geological Survey with respect to trying to find B-cell in the wild, over 100,000 samples across the United States, but almost zero sampling has been done within, in the pet trade within captive populations. So it's a big unknown. I wouldn't be surprised if B-cell is circulating within the pet trade within the United States. Okay, another way it could enter, just like the pathogen associated with the uh, fungus, the white nose syndrome fungus uh, that's killing bats in North America that was introduced from Europe, also could be on, uh, on mud, 
uh, or on contaminated gear uh, when folks go over to Europe or go over to Asia and they come back to the United States and immediately go out into the environment without cleaning or decontaminating their, their recreational gear. Um, the environmental persistence of bee cells probably a couple days, two to three days, so it's certainly possible that that could happen um, as well. Um, there have been some risk analyses that have already been performed by U.S. Geological Survey as well as by independent, uh, by um, ac academics. And this is the invasion probability uh, that has been suggested with several analyses. This one was in science. Uh, the red meaning high invasion probability of B cell. This is based on the environmental suitability of B cell, okay? Um, and as you can see, the southeast is, is lit up pretty good. Uh, Tennessee's right really in the middle of that in southern Appalachia, as well as the northwestern United States, and also down here in south central Mexico, up in, in the higher elevation mountains there. Um, the issue with that, the, this research, is that they haven't taken into consideration species susceptibility. So yes, maybe environmental conditions are good, but are any of your species susceptible, right? And so that's been at least the initial interest for several of the funding agencies, the state wildlife agencies and the private foundations that have provided money to University of Tennessee is to look at relative susceptibility, okay? So we have done that set in the last three years. We've tested 30 species of amphibians, 24 salamander and six anurans, six frog species. And uh, we do this all within a biocontrol facility, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. And again, our idea is, all, is really to refine these, these invasion probability maps. Why? Why do we care creating these maps? Because it can be used for planning. It can be used for planning for doing pathogen surveillance in the wild. Um, and it also can be used in response. If we do detect B cell in the wild, which is, is probably very likely inevitable, um, where do we really need to be super concerned? Okay, where are the most vulnerable species within our country, within a state, within you know, a county? Where, where are they located and how should we respond? Uh, and this will be information especially that state wildlife health agencies are, are going to be interested in. So we tested, this is just a list of the species we've tested. Our goal was really to get a broad taxonomic representation of, of species, of salamander species as well as frog species and, um, and uh, to look at their susceptibility. Uh, again, we do all this research here at the University of Tennessee. The methods that we follow are recommendations that were come up by the North American B cell task force with respect to experimental protocols and with respect to biosecurity protocols. We follow BSL-2 containment practices, which are used for human pathogens. So we are super secure with respect to doing the pathogen, uh, doing research here. Our research is within a locked facility and our research with the pathogen is within then locked chambers, okay? Uh, all of our research uh, is approved through the University of Tennessee Institutional Animal Use and Care Committee. And basically it involves exposing the animal to different doses of the pathogen and we also look at how they uh, develop the disease depending on different environmental conditions, so different temperatures, et cetera. Uh, if you want to learn more about the project in general and the methods, you can go to this website or you can just type in UT BSAL, and, uh, University of Tennessee BSAL, and it'll, it'll pop up. So I'm just going to jump straight into the results. This is a summary of the results of over a thousand animals, 30 species over the last three years. And the first result is 75% of the species we tested became infected. So as a disease ecologist, we would say the pathogen has an extremely broad host range, meaning it can infect a lot of different species, which is not a good thing. Secondly, nine of those species developed chytridiomycosis, the disease associated with B cell, you know, kill, blowing these holes through the skin and ultimately the animals dying. So 30% of the species that we tested. Uh, of the salamander species that, that, that uh, developed the disease, um, we saw it, these are three newt species. So this is the newt family, which is very common in Europe. We have, um, seven species of newts in North America. 
three of those are in eastern North America, and they're in the family uh, or genus Nonophthalmus. Uh, this species right here is the eastern newt. If you all have been out to ponds, uh, almost any water body in Tennessee, you're going to see eastern newts. They're very, 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 very common. They're also very, very, very susceptible. Okay, so that's a species that we're really focusing a lot of our research on now because they have a tremendous ability to potentially become infected, uh, die themselves, but also amplify the pathogen in the environment. This group of salamanders too has tremendous dispersal capability. They can move, you know, up to five kilometers across the landscape. Okay, several miles. All right. Um, these two species are actually species of conservation concern. This one is, it has a very narrow distribution, the striped newt, that is in uh, Florida, only found in Florida and Georgia. And this species here, the black spotted newt right here, is on the federal endangered species list. Okay? And the Tarika species is in the western United States. So there's threats in the western United States as well. This group of salamanders, the plethodontids, um, are called the lungless salamanders. And the reason they're called that is because they have no lungs. They respire 100% through the skin. So you can imagine a pathogen that is blowing holes through the skin is not good if you have to breathe through your skin, right? So this is very concerning. Moreover, this is the most species rich family of salamanders on the globe and also in the United States in Tennessee. If you didn't know, Southern Appalachia is a global biodiversity hotspot. We have more salamander species per unit area than any other place in the world right in our region, North Carolina, North Georgia, Tennessee, uh, Western North Carolina, okay? And nearly all of them fall in this family. Moreover, uh, these two species here, the, these first two ones, fall within this family, uh, subfamily Spurlopinae. There are 42 endemic species, meaning they only exist within the United States with, uh, um, that are within this subfamily. And we've, all, we've tested two of those genera and know that they're susceptible. So this could be a major concern. The other thing is, is that over half of those species are species of conservation concern. Uh, this species here, Encentina, which is right here, is a very unique and fairly uh, rare species that is in Western United States. And these two species, uh, through collaborating with uh, our colleagues in Mexico, these two species are from Mexico. And so Mexico certainly is very concerned with respect to the pathogen as well, because they're very, very susceptible. Now, what does the pathogen look like? Okay, this is at the early stages of disease development. Okay, you can see these lesions. These are holes that are created. This is an inverted photo that helps show it, them a little bit better. Okay, this is right at the beginning. They'll get them on the snout. They'll get them on their, on their digits, but then it gets to be systemic and widespread throughout the body. It's blowing holes right through the epidermis. And histologically, you can see that. Here's that volcano-like, all these dead cells. Uh, Dr. Deborah Miller is our pathologist who uh, has a joint appointment with the vet school here at UT. And this is actually, B cell is penetrating down into a gland. Okay, so it can penetrate, penetrate all the way down in the, into the dermis, down into glands, et cetera. Um, this species here is the green salamander, a species of high conservation concern that's already declining throughout uh, Appalachia. And this is about mid-stage of disease development. Again, an inverted photo where you can see those lesions that are popping up as fluorescent. And this is what can happen at the very end stages. All the lesions become so systemic and so deep, they start to actually uh, penetrate and compromise capillaries, and the animals begin to bleed. Um, this, some of the other gross signs that you see are changes in their actual behavior. So they can exhibit convulsions, lethargy, loss of writing reflex. So you flip them over, they can't flip back, um, and, and eventually paralysis. And uh, again, Dr. Deborah Miller is the lead pathologist. Uh, she's an anatomical pathologist. And Dr. Agata uh, Greslak is a, uh, a DVM clinical pathologist that's a resident um, here in our vet school. And they're doing uh, the work with respect to the pathogenesis or how does B cell cause disease. All right, 
what's going on here potentially is why are these animals basically exhibiting paralysis? So again, as I mentioned before, amphibians osmoregulate through their skin. And this pathogen is blowing holes through the skin. So one possibility is that it's impairing osmoregulation. Why is that important? Well, what that can happen is, what can happen is you can have an electrolyte imbalance within the, within the animal. In particular, um, in particular uh, changes in calcium and sodium levels are very important with respect to a physiological process called the actin myosin cross bridge cycle, which is important for contraction of muscles. Um, and if that is impaired, you can become paralyzed. That's actually the mechanism that another similar pathogen, another type of batrachychytrium, actually kills um, amphibians. But what that, the, the other species does is it actually thickens the skin, whereas this species of batrachychytrium blows holes in the skin. So right now, Dr. Miller is, is, a, is investigating, this is part of the NSF grant, why do animals die or how do animals die? from this disease. All right, here's the full summary of the 30 species. Um, we really kind of already talked about these over here, but we do have some species here that actually become infected and don't die. These are what we consider low risk, but they also can keep the pathogen around, okay? Uh, so there are carrier species, and we do have some resistant species. So really, this is an important thing with trying to understand why this is happening. So we're working with immunologists at Vanderbilt University and also UMass Boston to try to figure out, they're very interested in figuring out what makes these animals special, okay? Um, the other concern here is that these animals at the bottom here are all frogs. And so one species that uh, is common here in the eastern United States is the eastern spadefoot. These are infection prevalence bars. Uh, this is across the duration of an experiment uh, swab one, two, and three, this just represents weeks. But you can see this is 100% prevalence, 100% infection of, of these animals. And you can even see the presence of the little zoosporangium down here, which are the reproductive components of, 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 the, of the pathogen. Um, we just finished uh, a project on Cuban tree frogs. This is an invasive pathogen um, where we got the frogs from uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. They sent them up here and we tested their susceptibility. These animals actually look like they developed B. salcotridiomycosis, and we've had some animals that actually did, did die, which is a very novel finding because catridiomycosis development within a frog has not been developed, has not been published on yet, has not been known to happen. And we can see those volcano-like ulcerations happening. You can see the lesions, again, with this inverted photo happening with Cuban tree frogs. And as much as this is an invasive species, you might be like, oh, that's good. But that also means that they can amplify the pathogen. They can carry it around. There are Cuban tree frogs that are taking hikes on vehicles all across the southeastern United States uh, in, in international shipments, et cetera. So this is really a, a major concern. Another major concern in a species that is shipped across the globe are Mexican axolotls for uh, medical, uh, biomedical research. And we'll talk a little bit about why they're really interesting biomedically in just a second. But um, also they're in the pet trade. A lot of folks have axolotls as pets. And they can, th this is different doses of the pathogen. And you can see these gray bars, these are infection prevalence across uh, the experiment. The bottom line is you see across all the doses, you see some level of infection, meaning that this species could uh, you know, millions of these animals are shipped around the globe, okay? So this species could facilitate that long distance translocation and spill over eventually into the environment. We do have axolotls that are living that have been introduced um, into, into, into the United States. So there are wild populations that are not supposed to be there. So what is a summary of the, the information here? What's our evidence that we have so far? Uh, first of all, North American amphibian assemblages uh, based on the sampling we've done so far across these 30 species, this broad taxonomic kind of survey, um, we found that 75% can become infected. Moreover, 30% um, can develop the disease. So number one, uh, we have ample susceptible hosts out in our communities, even more ample, very likely, than Europe to actually maintain the pathogen in the, in the environment, but also amplify the pathogen in the environment. So if it gets here, 
we're gonna, we need to respond quickly, okay? It's gonna be a major issue, all right? We have four and a half times the species that Europe does with respect to, uh, just with respect to salamanders alone, okay? Um, also, our frogs. We found four of six frog species became infected, all right? Frogs represent 95% of international amphibian trade into the United States. We're talking not thousands, we're talking millions of frogs enter the United States every year. None of them have to be screened for pathogens, okay? And again, with respect to the conservation threat, with our sample of species, 30% of them develop disease. If we take that as an indicator of what could happen with respect to our, just our salamander species here in the United States, we're talking potentially because of our large species richness, up to 60 species uh, could be potentially affected. That would be the greatest biodiversity catastrophe that human history has seen with respect to a pathogen uh, in wild populations. Right now, we've, a lot of y'all have heard about white nose syndrome, right? 10 bat species are known to develop white nose syndrome, and there are millions upon millions of dollars and a massive, uh, uh, interstate, national, international effort to stop the spread of that disease. This certainly, if it gets to the United States because of our super high biodiversity of, of amphibians and salamanders, is going to be a major catastrophe. Okay? So we do have a combination of what we call super susceptible amplification species and carrier species in the United States and potentially suitable environmental conditions, hence the, the, the highlight there, to exist to create the perfect storm for B cell emergence. That's why we need to prevent it from coming here. We should have some means, some regulations to prevent that. Some sort of permitting to say, no, you need an animal health certificate for wildlife. Okay, I will just touch quickly um, on some of the new NSF results. The NSF grant was secured last August, so we've just started that work. There's lots, of, it's, it's a, a very broad project with lots of collaborators. But I wanted to highlight some of Davis Carter's uh, research on at least the temperature range, the temperature suitability with respect to infectivity and pathogenicity of B cell. And so he's completed uh, with, the, with the adults, the adult, uh, Eastern newts, remember this is the most, one of the most common newt species in all of North America with a range from Florida all the way up into Canada and all the way to the Mississippi, okay? Very, very abundant and that's what we're focusing this research on because their potential role uh, if the pathogen gets here. At 22 degrees Celsius, okay, so that's just above 70 degrees Fahrenheit or right around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, no infection or disease. Actually, the pathogen will grow in culture at this temperature, but it does not infect eastern newts. That's very, very interesting and actually very important. At 14C, okay, we do see infection and disease and we actually see about 95% mortality and the mean survival duration is only about a couple of weeks. So they're dying extremely, extremely fast. At 6C, colder, 100% mortality, except they die a little bit slower. Okay, the interesting thing is what Davis did is then compared how infected the animals were. Okay, compared those between the 14C and the 6C and actually the ones at the lower temperature die at six times lower uh, infection loads of the pathogen. And that's because with ectothermic vertebrates, their immune response is much, much slower at colder temperatures. The pathogen itself also grows slower at colder temperatures, but that decrease in immunological uh, response barriers is much, much faster, much less. So we call this uh, potentially the White Walker effect. If you all are Game of Thrones fans, if you aren't, Google it, Game of Thrones, White Walker, you'll get it. Watch the last episode, it's coming out the last season, oh my gosh, we're all gonna <laughs> cry after that. Uh, so anyways, this is, in other words, winter is coming. Winter is coming, right? And that is true, winter is coming, and this has major implications with respect to the potential emergence of B cell. Remember we said 22C, no problem. Where's 22C, average annual temperature? Well, you're talking southern Texas, southern Florida. But basically the majority of the United States is gonna fall where winter is coming, 
for these, for these animals. All right, the last thing I just want to just, just touch on and kind of breeze through, and I uh, don't want to be too long on my time, is why do we care? You know, this is a public forum. Why should you care? Some of y'all are scientists and ecologists and know a lot about amphibians, um, and, and, and others don't. And I'll tell you why we should care. There are various reasons. And uh, very common ecological and environmental reasons, we say, is because amphibians compose a lot of biomass within an ecosystem. They sequester carbon, and that buffers climate change. They also eat lots of things, and they poop lots of things, and that facilitates nutrient cycling, and the plants take it up, and we hug the trees, and we love it all. And that's important, all right? And also things, they eat things, and things eat them, and we all should love these things. It's very important, environmental st stability. Absolutely, absolutely. But at the same time, does the general public really care a lot of times about those sorts of important, very important benefits. Not as often, but they do eat insects. Insects uh, that can also carry zoonotic pathogens and kill humans, especially babies, especially older folks, right, that have impaired immune systems. This is just, and I, I'm, I'm also bringing frogs into this discussion, but this is an estimate of cricket frogs. Cricket frogs are this big. Most salamanders are this big and eat a lot more. But 1,000 cricket frogs, which you can have at, at, at a couple wetlands, can eat 5 million insects per year, okay? Major, major impacts. One of the reasons people care, are starting to care a lot about bats is they've heard they eat a lot of insects. Insects that are bad for agricultural crops, insects that are bad for me, my kids, etc. Where you have healthy amphibian populations, you generally have very few mosquitoes. Why? Because the adults are eating them, and also these guys, all of their larvae, the tadpoles, the salamander larvae, they're all insectivores. They love these nice, yummy, yummy mosquito larvae. And, they, and they're, they're easy. They're just dangling there like a hot dog. You know, very easy for them to, to eat, okay? So, public health reasons. Also, biomedical reasons for humans. Research done by Dr. Louise Rollins-Smith at Vanderbilt University and her colleagues has demonstrated that the antimicrobial peptides that are produced in the skin, the chemicals, some of the chemicals produced in the skin of amphibians can inhibit HIV. Okay, it can prevent T cell infection. Moreover, dendritic cells are infected. It can prevent them from transferring HIV to T cells. The late, great John Daly, NIH uh, researcher, used to go down to the tropics in the 70s and lick frogs and be like, if my tongue tingles, I know there's something going on. He's isolated during his life over 500 chemicals, toxins, from various amphibians, many of which have extremely powerful and favorable analgesic capabili capabilities that can be 20 to 40 times more potent than morphine and not have addictive effects. Limb regeneration. Salamanders have incredible limb regeneration capability, especially that axolotl that I mentioned. Lots of research being done at uh, uh, UC Irvine, Harvard, et cetera, looking at the capabilities. What are these, these animals doing to allow for re limb regeneration? Can we train our cells to be, be able to regenerate the way? Because we, we all started that way, right? It's amazing. Once our differentiated cells become like skeletal cells, they don't know how to go back to being things like undifferentiated like stem cells. Amazing. Can we figure that out? There's a lot of folks that are uh, doing research on that. Uh, where was I? Okay. Um, there are other biomedical potentials that, again, if you're kind of interested in this, this is a, a great review, amphibian contributions to ecosystem services. Again, lots of other potential human benefits. We also, food-wise, across the globe, uh, we um, 
uh, amphibians, we, we, we transport or, or trade 23 to 72 metric tons of amphibians a year for food alone. Okay, do you know that actually the United States and uh, France and Belgium lead the world in imports of actually frogs from Asia that are raised um, for our own uses and consumption. And a lot of them, this is in Albany, New York. Live frogs for sale, okay? Uh, also, lots of folks love them for pets because they can be very colorful, like these Asian salamanders up here. They're commonly in trade. Uh, over in China, the, giant, the Chinese giant salamander, as well as in Japan, there's the, uh, the, the ja Japanese giant salamander, are, have a lot of cultural values and spiritual values. And then another thing that ecologists often say is, you know, they are the canary in the, gold, uh, the coal mine. Gold mine, coal mine. <laughs> um, you know, and that is true. You know, they do absorb things from the environment. They, they can absorb toxins and things like that. If negative things are happening to amphibians, we should be concerned. With that, I will say that in North America, we are organized. Um, this has never happened before prior to a wildlife pathogen entering a country. Uh, which was formed out of a 2015 uh, workshop that USGS, US Geological Survey, organized. We have a technical advisory committee and multiple working groups. Salamanderfungus.org is the website. You can learn more information about it. We've put together, uh, there's annual reports. We've put together a response plan. What do you do if we detect it under different conditions? Also, we just released a strategic plan that has details for all these different groups. What can you do, okay? So if you see sick amphibians, there is a national reporting system that we just developed a few years ago through the Partners in Amphibian, uh, Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, PARC, PARC. PARC, and then type amphibians, you'll get their website, parkplace.org. There's a disease, a national disease task team that I'm a part of, and there is a reporting system. You can send an email to this email and say, I've got a pro I, see, I've saw, I saw dead frogs, and we will let the authorities know in your area to go investigate it. The other thing you should consider doing is getting involved in volunteer amphibian monitoring programs like Frog Watch USA. We also have TAMP, Tennessee Amphibian Monitoring Program, here in Tennessee. If you want more information on that, you can email me or, or, or just kind of Google those and find them out yourself. The last thing I want to end on is a very creative uh, description of our research that uh, our undergrads, uh, as well as Davis, put together uh, last spring. It's uh, the bee cell wrap. As you can see, Davis there, very uh, studious PhD student. Labeled those insisted from doses given for the 
pose a threat and all done you rock Kill it every fire sell the band and all more stars you rock Not much time till it gets to the shores of us The US that is the fact is its impact could be disastrous But in the lab we trust transmission models made by Dr. Gray Pathology by Dr. Deborah Miller Through this pathogen a possible serial killer Analyzing at risk species responses Meso causes contact rates and mathematical models Don't have much time so we going full throttle So we going full throttle how we do it yeah, uh, have to kill it like a rat, need to utilize heat. Where we do it in the lab, 35 degrees C. Ecosystem could collapse, you gotta know just where we at. East Tennessee, UTK, we gotta react. Have to kill it like a rat, need to utilize heat. Where we do it in the lab, 35 degrees C. Ecosystem could collapse, you gotta know just where we at. East Tennessee, UTK, we gotta react. We gotta react. They are far cooler than I am. I know we're running short on time, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, it looks like global warming is working in your favor. Potentially, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Just a joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. What, any research on what happens to fish that eat there and the effects of government? Yeah, so the question is uh, about fish and if they ate an infected salamander. Um, so this is a skin pathogen that's only known to infect amphibians and, and specifically more so salamanders. So it's very unlikely that it would be transmitted to fish. Um, and even, even if a, one salamander eats another salamander, the internal route of infection wouldn't exist. Okay, it has to, it has to infect the skin. It only goes in basically into the keratinized tissue of the skin. So it's probably even unlikely in that capacity too. So external exposure is the key to the pathogen. It's a good question, yeah. Do you, do you have a legislative advocate yet for, for pets? For, for more regulations? Yeah. So do we have a legislative uh, advocate with respect to more regulations? Especially the pet trade. In, in, in pet trade. Amphibians. Yes. So there, there, um, there was, is, sort of. Okay. It's on pause now, as you can imagine. Yes. Um, what do you do if you follow those salamanders out here in Nepal tomorrow? Right, right. Yeah, so the question is, is what do we do if we find, uh, and I, not just a dead salamander, but it's confirmed. So the response plan that's been released and that we put together has a series of things, like what if, if a salamander is detected within captivity and it's verified, what it's, if it's detected in the wild uh, and verified, and then what are the possible responses? So the first thing is just figuring out. So for the last several years, we've actually been doing tons of diagnostic testing on dead amphibians, especially salamanders, and nothing's come back as, as being positive. Uh, but when it does happen, um, there's a, a group that's called the, the management group, kind of the response group formed also into expanded into the management group. What can we do? And right now, um, there are a variety of things you could do. I think the, 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 and it would depend on where it happened and what, how, you know, what, who owned the property, but uh, probably the likely thing would be to try to go in and, and, and try to eradicate it immediately. Um, I don't know. You know, and um, so, you know, this is such a serious pathogen. The, the response plan talks about actually intense surveys around it, but depending on where it is, like for example, if it was a small pond, you might be able to dr drain the pond. Um, you could and eliminate the host. Uh, so depending on the types of species that are there, that may be a concern. If it is on federal land, the whole everything changes because there's so many other acts and requirements that govern the sorts of activities that can happen on federal land. If it's on state land um, or it's on private land, you have much more latitude. Um, but also if there's, um, 